world turned upside down. Let me give you a brief introduction to Ambassador Toro Hadi. He is the Venezuelan ambassador to Singapore and formerly to the United States, United Kingdom, Spain, Brazil, Chile and other. He uh, also has a distinguished academic career, director of the Diplomatic Academy of the Venezuelan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, member of the Advising Committee of the Diplomatic Academy of London, Fulbright Scholar, visiting professor at Princeton University and the University of Brasilia, online professor at the University of Barcelona and associate professor at the Simon Bolivia University, where he was the director of the North American Studies Center and coordinator of the Institute of Higher Latin American Studies. He's also authored many books, 27 books on his CV, uh, on international affairs, and twice he has won the Latino Book Award, best book by an author whose original language is in Spanish or Portuguese in the category of History, Political Sciences at the Expo America Book Fair at Chicago and Los Angeles. Today, uh, Ambassador will talk to us about how the South is emerging and how the world is turned upside down. Uh, in the last 20 years, the correlation of economic power experience and immense upturn. The 80s was the previous century marked their end with the convergence of phenomena, collapse of com communism, debt crisis, fall in the price of commodities and re-emergence of IMF and exponential growth of financial markets. So at that time, the West stood unbeatable while developing nations appeared impoverished and indebted. However, in 2008, the other side of the coin emerged with the appearance of systemic, systemic economic crisis of the West. Without further ado, I would like to now pass the meeting over to Ambassador Dorokhan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here today at the sales and uh, uh, very honored as well uh, to be in the presence of Ambassador Pani and the members of his staff. And uh, thank you very much for the attendance of such a distinguished group of friends and uh, uh, people from uh, uh, different areas of activity. The fall of the Berlin Wall symbolized the triumph of a communist. The winner was the capitalist model, a model with different barriers each of which claiming the right to be its best expression. I'm of this version by the Anglo-Saxon and the East Asian, as well as the different variants of uh, capitalism prevailing in continental Europe. Germany and East Asia highlighted a surge of consensus and worker stability within a stakeholder mentality, while in France and East Asia, free market and government planning were the two sides of the same coin. In all of them, a long-term vision of the company prevailed. The Anglo-Saxon version had a much more flexible attitude regarding jobs and social benefits and excluded the state, while it emphasized a shareholder mentality of economics and a short-term vision of the company. It soon, began, it soon became evident that the Anglo-Saxon model was carrying the day. The extraordinary dynamism of the American economy made it possible. Uh, that is to say, the American model became the economic paradigm bound to carry on its shoulders the way of the globalization process. According to Anthony Giddens and Will Hutton, and I quote, globalization favors shareholder, shareholder value-driving capitalism, and it's been driven by, by it. So it's hardly surprising that all the variants of capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, are being left aside, end of the quote. This emerging paradigm would be felt in the third world basically through two means the Washington Consensus and the GATT Uruguay Round. Consensus and Round presented themselves as two huge pincers uh, forcing the acceptance of the dominant paradigm within developing economy. 
The term Washington Consensus was coined in 19, 19, uh, 1989 by economist John Williamson to include the 10 directives visualized by the U.S. Treasury Department, the IMF, the World Bank, and a group of think tanks based in Washington as the panacea for economic reform. According to Moises Naim, and I quote, its appeal was held by its self-assured tone, its prescribed orientation and sense of direction and its origin in Washington, the capital of the victorious empire, end of the quote. In other words, the Washington Consensus became the most visible but a visible symbol of the new economic <coughs> order. Within its ten prescription were the following trade liberalization, privatization, deregulation, fiscal policy fiscal policy discipline, tax reform, reduction, reduction of public expenditures, etc. The International Monetary Fund was entrusted with spreading all around the world the above mentioned prescriptions. The rigidity with, it, with which this organism assumed this function became proverbial. <clears throat> in parallel with the Washington Consensus and the implementation of its policies by the IMF, the negotiations of the GATT Uruguay Round were taking place. Albeit they had started in 1986, three years before the definition of the Washington Consensus. Uh, the collapse of communism and the emergence of the new economic paradigm deeply affected the negotiations already in course that were to be concluded in 1993. <coughs> During the 70s and the first half of the 80s, the developing world has showed ambition and cohesion in the quest for a more equitable economic order. During that period, it fought for, for what it was called the new international economic order was channeled through the United Nations Commission for Trade and Development. The North South Dialogue was institutionalized in which developing countries managed to set up to set uh, a common position via the so-called G77. <clears throat> the conjunction of the external debt and the collapse in the price of commodities including the loss of negotiating power by OPEC, seriously shattered the strength and the cohesion of the G77 and led this country into a much more flexible attitude. <clears throat> Likewise, the fundamental negotiation within the industrialized world, with the industrialized world, went from the United Nations to the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff. This trans of the negotiation from one forum to the other accounted for the ambition of the developed countries of opening a new round of trade negotiations within a friendlier uh, framework. According to David Hill and Anthony McGrew, and I quote, until 1993, international trade was regulated globally under the auspices of the GATT. Uh, a very loose institution whose rules and procedures were developed in an ad hoc way. Within this arrangement, there was a clear inequality of power, with the US, European Union, Japan, and Canada being able to work behind the scenes to shape most decisions." End of the quote. Such round was called the Uruguay round. And, was, and, and uh, known as Uruguay Grant, was called to cover the new trade areas. That is to say, services, intellectual property, and investment. Agriculture would also be included. In contrast with a more confrontational attitude experience within the framework of the North-South negotiations, the North-South dialogue uh, in previous years, the developing countries enter into a process of multiple concessions in areas such as foreign investment liberalization, reduction of tariffs and export subsidies, extension of international trade law to the service sector, 
reductions of limits to import of foreign goods, acceptance of intellectual property guidelines from the West, etc. The decisive reason for this complex attitude before the demands of the developed world could be explained within what we might call the credibility syndrome. The weakened position of the developing economies as a result of the conjunction of the debt crisis and the collapse in the price of commodities, together with the emergence of a new economic paradigm, left them with no other option but to keep into the prevailing order. The burden, the burden of proof regarding reliability as an international actor fell on this context. That is to say, in order to be taken seriously, it was necessary to accept the new rules of the game. This way, developing economies started to liberalize their trade and economic regimes as means to earn the required credibility before the powerful coalition that sustained the emerging ideas. The dominant coalition they surrendered to was composed by the multilateral financial organisms as well as the government the financial markets and the multimedia of the West. Special mention has to be made to the financial and media centers, to big financial media centers. The former had exponentially grown since the big bang of the London Stock Exchange in 1986, while the later had managed through several gigantic fusions to consolidate a true world oligopoly. Both had in common its convergence around the new economic order imposing credibility or ostracist parameters among nations according to their acceptance or rejections of those rules of the game. The, dec the decades of the 90s represented the climax of this era, marked by the predominance of the West. In November, December 1999, down, the pendulum started to swing back on a progressive but unstoppable way. This was the day of the World Trade Organization Summit in Seattle. There, the developing economies faced with the fact that the costly sacrifices that they had made in areas of services, intellectual property, and trade liberalization had not been met with due reciprocity became much more assertive in their position. It is worth mentioning that the World Trade Organization, WTO, had been created in 1995 uh, as, in, as the natural heir to the GATT, and it was there where subsequent international trade negotiations, uh, trade and investment negotiations, would take place. At the time of the Seattle summit, the United States not only did continue passing stricter trade regulations, and raising its non-tariff barriers, but most of the industrialized countries had not fulfilled their commitment to reduce agricultural subsidies in the terms agreed during the Uruguay round. The multiple and cumulative concessions made by developing economies had not been reciprocated, presenting this negotiation as a one-way highway. Uh, before the demands of adding to the negotiation new topics that would imply additional sacrifices, the developing world began to assume a more confrontational attitude. The new attitude of the Southern Hemisphere would be consolidated during the three subsequent WTO summits at Doha, Cancun, and Hong Kong. This seemed unavoidable due to the arrogant show by developed economies. All of them reduced to eliminate their agricultural subsidies and roughly defended their textile industry, while putting more pressure on developing nations to negotiate new rules on areas such as investments, competition, government acquisitions, and easing of trade. China's entry into the WTO in 2001 and the combined leverage of this nation with the other two big emerging economies, India and Brazil, provided the developing world with a new platform. The weakness and frustration that prevailed during these 
among these countries during the Uruguay round was definitively left behind. A new sensation of empowerment was in the air. The Doha round of negotiations showcased a confrontation between the, no the North and the South. Within the theme, emerging economies forged common positions around matters such as elimination of agricultural subsidies, access to industrialized markets for non-agricultural goods, special and differential treatment, the special case of cotton, and the so-called Singapore issues, meaning investment competition, public market transparency, and trade easing. This eye-to-eye -eye relation with the developed world was seen as the sign of a new time. The empowerment of the South at multilateral trade negotiations came together with the progressive discredit of the Washington Consensus, whose despastating effects were being felt all around the world. Indeed, a series of economic... Uh, okay. uh, indeed, a series of economic crises that frequently entailed social revolts of high political impact were eroding support for the consensus. The most relevant of such crises took place in Mexico in 1994, East Asia in 1997-1998, Russia in 1998, and Argentina in 2001-2002. Each of them produced a snowball effect that threatened with getting out of control and destroying everything on its path. With surprising ease, indeed, countries or entire regions lost overnight investor trust and were left entirely vulnerable. The expansive waves of this cataclysm of known epicenter threatened in turn and gratuitously other emerging economies that had not only reasonable comply with the set rules but that were located at distant places. Mexico, as well as Argentina and Russia, had followed with discipline the directives of the IMF and the prescription of the Washington Consensus. These countries reduced the income expenditure gap, deregulated their financial sectors, massively privatized industries and state services, liberalized their trade, etc. Moreover, the three of them incurred an immense social tension in order to provide an environment that could be attractive to foreign investors. In all of them, the shock therapy, therapy produced high unemployment and a dramatic reduction of the social needs provided by the state. The state industry that so much effort had to, to build in the three countries were clear off to private hand, breeding a new cast of billionaires. Despite the immense sacrifices made in the three cases, the disfavor of investors was immediate and implacable as soon as the contradictions of the model generated problems. To put oneself in the hand of the market meant to surrender the defense mechanism of society to an impatient and hurtless master. Many believe, uh, many believe that the Asian crisis of 1997 had a different nature than the previous one. Was it so? In 1997, East Asian economies entered into a deep crisis. Both East Asian and the Anglo-Saxon market economy models suddenly found themselves in the dark. For Asian economies, where the crisis originated, the, plan, the blame was on the other side. From their perspective, had they not liberated and re-regulated the market according to the neoliberal model, the crisis would have never occurred. For market economy supporters, on the other hand, their responsibility lay on the other side. According to their judgment, the irrational use of lent funds ignited a recited spiral. Both sides intended to keep distance with the alleged offender. With no doubt, there were important responsibilities at both sides. Nevertheless, it is evident that none of this would have happened without a market inundated with liquidity 
when an international cast of professional borrowers reacted with paranoia when faced with bad news. By liberalizing their economies and putting themselves on the hands of George Soros and his peers, the successful East Asian model opened its door to uncertainty. The result was 100 million people descending back into poverty. As in the cases of Mexico, Russia, and Argentina, the massive stampede of capital, out of rational proportions, led the countries involved dance on their knees. To the rest of the world, though, the East Asian model was discredited while the market economy emerged on a stronger footing. However, after East Asia has got a taste of the bitter medicine of approaching too much to the American model, they draw their own conclusions. As the Russians and the Latin Americans, they would be aware in the future about the risks involved by this. The moment when most of the world would seek to disassociate itself from the Washington parameters would not take many years to come. While all this was happening, an alternative economic paradigm was shaping up. It was based on the outstanding economic emergence of China. To understand what had happened, it is necessary to go back to 1979. On that year, Deng Xiaoping initiated a process of economic change based on a new lecture of the international order. The central pillars of his proposal were to leave behind the period of war and revolution to step into an era, into a new era of economic openness without political change. However, then not only assume as a priority the need for economic development, but the fact of doing it on an endogenous way. That is to say, defining economic strategies based on the specificities of China. This implies an autonomous strategy away from the shock therapies characteristic of the Washington consensus that so much damage was provoking everywhere. The Chinese case came over to become the most powerful argument against the invisible hand of the market. It took the pathways of progressive stages and periodic adjustment, adjust, adjustment in which transitory policies acted as bridges from one stage, stage into the next one. The gradualness of the process was shown through the management of its export and domestic production industries. The former was channeled 